Hi everyone, um, my name is Deepal Parekh and I am a current student at University of Houston Clear Lake. Um, today we will talk to Dr. Paul Wagner again. Today's topic is an unconventional sketch of a history of educational psychology. Dr. Paul Wagner has served as full-time professor of philosophy and logic with the College of Human Sciences and Humanities. And areas, uh, he's also an area coordinator for statistics, research, and educational psychology with the College of Education at University of Houston Clear Lake. Uh, he was former vice president of Association of Philosophers in Education and former executive secretary of the Philosophy of Education Society. Dr. Wagner, thank you so much for your time and today's discussion on un uh, on un conventional sketch of history of educational psychology. It's good to be with you. I have a couple of questions in mind. I'll start if you're ready. I'm ready. <laughs> so um, Michael Tomasella and uh, Leonard uh, Lodinow have used evolutionary psychology to explain the development of education starting with mimicking elders do this and do that as I do to the institutional structures today. Is education from the beginning to now all about uh, indoctrinating students into acceptable social behavior? Well, it raises interesting questions because one of the things that these uh, evolutionary psychologists point out is that, you know, clearly when we came out of the jungles onto the African savanna, um we were forming small tribes and it was one thing when we were just a family uh your mom and dad could without even trying could mimic um how it is that the uh, the kids should uh behave but once we started forming little tribes then it became more important that we watched that all children seemed to be picking up things that uh the parents needed them to pick up to share in a hunt to prepare uh, food, uh, to cure hides, and uh, they had to be done in certain ways. And so the approach to education when we became tribal uh, really did become here, see what I do, do what I do, and do it like this. Is that what we're doing in education today? Well, we shouldn't be because we, we should have covered a lot of territory since then. We live in a different world. And unfortunately, there are many who would claim, and for good reason, that we do seem to be approaching the education of the young with the same, here, see what I'm doing? Now you do it just this way as well. So during my undergrad for a bachelor's of psychology, um, I, I did uh, come across this question in my mind. Why is Aristotle called the father of psychology? Well, um, Aristotle gets credit for being a father of a whole bunch of things, logic, democracy, science, and, 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 and he's the father of psychology too. And what he did that made him the father of psychology is he said, you know, I want to take a look at what makes people think as they think and, and not just look at the products of our thinking. So he, he watched us and he, he tried to think what it is that makes us get into the thoughtful practices uh, that we get into. He makes a distinction, for example, uh, between uh, prudential thinking and moral thinking. And moral thinking, we're trying to figure out how ought I to treat another person. And then prudential thinking, I'm trying to think of um, how uh, can I uh, play my cards right not to get in trouble right now. Thank you. Um, next one for you. Who is Blaise Pascal and how did he help people come to understand decision making under conditions of uncertainty and uncertainty? Well, if you look at a lot of business decision books and as well as a lot of um, uh, cognitive psychology books, you're going to see uh, Pascal referenced as the father of decision making under uncertainty. What Pascal did was he employed some statistical tools for the first time 
to try to figure out, look, when you can't deduce a best answer, isn't there still a better way, a systematic way of picking out options that are better than their competitors? And so that's decision-making under conditions of uncertainty. There is something that is uh, very famous that he did and it was called the Pascal's Wager. And essentially it's all about him telling a friend of his who was a nobleman, who was a gambler and um, uh, lived a, a wretched life. And uh, the gambler didn't know why he ought to change his life at all in any way. And Pascal turned out to be a, a religious fellow later on. And, and he said, well, you know, imagine that you have uh, a limited amount of pleasure that you can get while living on, on this earth, living as you're living. Um, and let's make up a word called utils, utils of pleasure. So you have gathered more utils of pleasure than anybody in history, and you got to live for 200 years. No one lived that long ever. So you multiply all this pleasure times 200, and you got a number. You know, wow, this guy really did well in life. Now, compare it to, unfortunately, if you live that way, Pascal thought, you know, you wound up in a bad place afterwards for all of eternity. Now, imagine that there is a, uh, uh, an intelligence behind the universe that says you must live in a certain way if you want to live for all of eternity and live well for all of eternity. So if you're living for all of eternity, well, that's an infinite number, right? So however much pleasure is involved each year for all of eternity, and you can say, it, let's make it just 10 utils of pleasure each year, but multiply 10 times infinity, and it becomes unquestionable what you should do. And that is you should behave just the way the intelligence would demand you to behave and, and so on and so forth. So that's his advice to his friend, the gambler, on how he uh, ought to live if he wants to reap the greatest amount of reward overall. And if the gambler were to say, yeah, but how do you know that there is this great intelligence and so on? Pascal's response would be, I don't know, but this is the best bet you can make. An infinite amount of reward compared to your 200 years times whatever pleasure you had during those 200 years. It's a better bet. Pascal claimed. Now we've used Pascal to make all sorts of business decisions and decisions about the welfare of lots of people and lots of organizations ever since. He was a master of the development of statistical analysis along with Fermat and the Bernoulli family. Wow. So who is William James and why is he called the father of American psychology? and also the father of experimental psychology. William James was actually trained as a medical doctor. And in the um, 19th century, he wanted to be more scientific in our approach to psychology. I mean, he, he was familiar with, you know, things that we um, had gathered from Aristotle, Pascal, David Hume, and many others. But uh, he, he thought we, we should be able to run experiments to learn something about how you know, people actually think and, and why they think as they do. And uh, so because he wanted to bring the experimental method into deriving decisions about psychology, he's called the father of experimental psychology. And because he happened to be an American, um, he's uh, also called the father of uh, American psychology. Very interesting. So why did um, Alfred Benet develop the IQ uh, testing? And why do people such as the Harvard evolutionist, uh, Stephen, Go uh, Stephen J. Gould, uh, Yale's Robert Stenberg, and Harvard educational statistician, David Koretz, uh, disparage it so much? When Benet was starting out, uh, he, was, he was a Frenchman, and when he was starting out, he was concerned about those students who just seemed to have more trouble figuring things out than other students. So he thought, well, you know, if we put together a set of puzzles and we give them to kids and we figure out which kids seem to have the greatest
greatest difficulty in figuring out how to solve some of these puzzles, that directs our attention to the additional need these students have from teachers because the other students seem to be doing just fine. So he wanted to look at the students who were at the bottom third of the, their ability in solving these puzzles. And it was, it was that simple. Over in the United States, we had uh, a, a guy uh, by the name of Terman uh, out at um, Stanford. And Stanford wanted to, uh, uh, wanted, uh, wanted to make the test more scientific. And, and uh, he thought we could identify intelligence. So he took Binet's work and he added to it um, a standard distribution scale about what we call a bell-shaped curve. And so he wanted to say that average intelligence was between 80 to 120. Um, 120 to 140 meant you were smarter than the average bear. And above um, uh, uh, 140, then you were gosh awful smart. And you get above 160 and that's just astronomical. On the other end, between 80 and 60, I mean, yeah, between 80 and 60, um, and the other category was between 60 and 40, he used two technical terms that were very insensitive. He said people at those levels should be called morons and idiots. And I can't remember which category was which. One was idiots, one was morons. Very insensitive terms. One of the things that you risk when you start thinking that you can actually measure uh, intelligence, uh, because that was not Binet's idea at all. Stephen Jay Gould, who was the youngest fellow ever to become a full professor at Harvard, and he even became the curator of the famous Aguiz Museum at Harvard, wrote a book called The Mismeasure of Man. And he said, you can look throughout history, uh, the history of measuring intelligence, and whoever is making up the tests always manages to make up tests that make people that look something like him or her look smart and other people that look very different from him or her look not so smart and uh, that that should reveal to us that our ability to detect intelligence is uh, not what it ought to be if intelligence is a function of our brains then um, you know, presumably the kind of test you need is not a paper and pencil test, but you need to aspirate and take out tissue from different parts of the brain. And you need to uh, take a look at the efficiency of which uh, chemicals are passed in between these chemicals on a slide. Uh, as you're examining the brain tissue on a big scale, you try to match it up with what PET, PET scans and MRIs might tell you about the operation of brains under in different conditions, that might tell you something about intelligence, but we're nowhere near that sort of thing. Um, there was a, um, a British psychologist that said, we ought to instead talk about kinetic intelligence and um, uh, potential intelligence. Like you talk about kinetic energy in physics and potential energy in physics. Kinetic intelligence would be the intelligence you show can you solve these algebra problems? If you can, you're showing kinetic intelligence. Uh, can you list the presidents of the United States in order? If you can, you're showing kinetic intelligence. Could you learn to solve these math problems? Could you learn to memorize the presidents of the United States in order? Well, we can't determine that at this point. That would be reflective of what he would call potential intelligence. And we just don't have access to determining what the potential intelligence is of anyone. That psychologist, that British psychologist, by, by the way, his name was Richard Gregory. And it seems to be a good distinction to make because it keeps us modest in our ambitions as educators to pretend that we can identify somebody's potential intelligence um, when that may be beyond our resources at this point. In the um, uh, oh, around 19, or, or I'm sorry, around 2010, some, somewhere around there, a Nobel laureate in physics had had an IQ test that had identified him as having an IQ of around 112. You don't win Nobel prizes by being of ordinary intelligence. 
So what does that tell us? What he studied real hard? Uh, more than likely it tells us that our tests aren't revealing um, what we would like them to reveal. That's also the point that Robert Sternberg, when he was at Yale and then out of Wyoming also, had pointed out that our tests are misdirecting our attention to how we might best educate students. And um, uh, David Koritz at Harvard today, uh, you know, similarly says, if we focus on just people's ability to recognize answers on multiple choice tests, we're not learning anything at all about how well they might justify their understanding of this or that piece of reality. Wow. So who is um, Edward Thorndike and why is he called the father of educational psychology? Well, E.O. Thorndike comes along and he, uh, uh, you know, saw what had gone on with um, uh, Binet and, and he knew, of course, about uh, William James' effort to make psychology more scientific. And Thorndike was particularly interested in, in education. And he perhaps most famously remembered for a, a one-liner that he said at one point, he said, if it exists, it can be measured. And so that meant if he was going to be this expert psychologist uh, in education, then anything that was relevant to education, if it was relevant, it was something. So it should be measurable. And if it isn't measurable, then it doesn't exist. Well, maybe in some grand sense, that might not be such a strange idea but given that we know so little about learning, given that we know so little about intelligence, to be so demanding as Thorndike was, particularly at the time that he was doing this in the early part of the uh, previous uh, century, the 20th century, it was surely premature to make such a bold and demanding claim uh, on the work that educational psychologists were doing. His reason perhaps more than any other was to want educational psychology to look like other social sciences and other sciences in general. Sciences generate numbers, don't they? Numbers that we can bank on as we try to make uh, projections into future realities and how we might affect those. So in that regard, that's what made him the, the father of uh, educational psychology. Thank you. William Wundt and the physiologist Necker are uh, Gisalt psychologists. What do Gisalt psychologists have to say about learning and teaching? There's a one-liner that we get from the Gestalt psychologists that every teacher and everybody in education ought to always keep in mind. And the one-liner is this, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That is such an insight into human nature. I mean, that's genius. Uh, to go to Necker, uh, if you were to draw a cube in front of you, draw a cube. And you label four corners of the cube A, B, C, D. And then you label the back side or the front side of the computer e, F, G, A, uh, of the uh, cube E, F, G, H. And then you show that to somebody and say, which is the front side of the cube? And somebody might say, um, a, B, C, D, and if you were to say to them, no, you're wrong, chances are they'd stare at it and they would see the front and the back switch places. They would go, oh yeah, now I see that E, F, G, H is the front. Well, first of all, if you drew something, it's on a flat surface, there is no cube. But when you tell people, oh no, you've got your first guess wrong and they stare at it, they see the two switch. That's called a gestalt shift meaning that how the world presents itself to us seems to be similarly, or seems to be incredibly unique to the individual, and it can change in the individual's mind in a flash. We see that gestalt shift occur in a flash. One of the things that's interesting, you cannot watch a gestalt shift occur even in your own mind. You just see it happen, but you can't see it happen slowly. 
this thought shifts and there being more to something than um, more than uh, more than just the parts of something that make what we take it as a whole. If you want an example that you can all identify with, think about your world of romance. If you can make up a list of what makes a proper um, partner for you, you're not looking for a spouse. That's the way you shop for a car. The French have a saying, and it goes, je ne sais quoi. And what they mean by je ne sais quoi is that a person has a certain sort of indescribable quality that makes them more than just the list you might have had in front of you. And the Gestalt psychologist is telling us, essentially every student you have in your class did not come out of any kind of a cookie cutter. Every student, whether you like it or not, has a certain je ne sais quoi that individuates that student from the student next to him, behind him, in front of them, and so on. And so educators can't just look at the manufacture of teaching techniques to create predictable products in their students because each student has a certain je ne sais quoi that we need to take into account when we think about educating Ricky as well as educating Rebecca. So that's Gestalt psychology and that, that little message that they gave us is still well worth heeding. That was in about the 1920s, by the way. So we're moving right along. 1920s? 1920s, yeah. Wow. Wow. So the next question for you, J.B. Watson and B.F. Skinner um, founded behaviorism. What is that? Behaviorism is an attempt to uh, reduce uh, the study of psychology to something that truly looks scientific, looks like something you find in physics. And so essentially behaviorism says you can look at two things and they will help you predict the determinacy of what a person's next action might be. The two things you look at is the individual's experiential history. Add to that an immediate stimulus and you can predict the outcome. There is no mind doing any kind of reflecting. It's just experiential history. And then you plug into it um, a particular stimulus. And what happens to that stimulus is determined by that experiential history. The various types of reinforcement, classical reinforcement, operant conditioning and so on. But then the output is predictable. Now, the first guy to talk about that was J.B. Watson in the 1920s, competing with the Gestalt psychologists and so on. But the person most well known as a behaviorist was J.B. Uh, was um, I'm sorry, B.F. Skinner. Um, B.F. Skinner at Harvard turned behavioral psychology into uh, what, for many, became the paradigm of uh, of psychology. Uh, particularly educational psychology, but of psychology generally, um, at least until the 1950s. Uh, some historians of educational psychology say that in 1957, when Noam Chomsky wrote a review of Skinner's book, Verbal Behavior, he essentially destroyed the claim that you can make determining projections of how someone will behave simply by knowing their experiential history and an immediate input. Behaviorism hung around in different ways. And today uh, we talk about behavioral economics, but we're really not talking about behaviorism as a theory uh, of human nature, uh, but we're talking about, um, we're going to limit our look at evidence to help us understand more thoroughly something that we call uh, incentive theory, you know, what sorts of things are people likely to be responsive to 
and but we don't reduce our thinking about human nature as the behaviorist once did. Wow. So going a little personal, can you tell us the story about B.F. Skinner telling, uh, teaching your daughter how to memorize a speech uh, for school? One time um, when I was at, at, at Harvard, I wanted to um, go hear a uh, uh, psychologist giving a talk. And, and I wanted to go to reception afterwards for the faculty that um, at the reception is when you get some of the best peppering of questions of the, uh, the speaker that has come by. And, and I was a little downhearted because I, I didn't think I could go since um, I was uh, in Boston at the time with uh, my, my daughter and my oldest daughter and, and my son. And I had to go pick my daughter up. She's a freshman in high school. I had to go pick her up from high school. And so I'd missed the reception. Somebody had asked me, um, uh, well, how old is she? And I said, 14. They said, well, go ahead and bring her to the reception. And so I did. Now at the reception, everybody gravitated around the invited speaker. And there was this old fellow who was over in the corner and I recognized him. I mean, you know, B.O. Skinner is something like an Olympian god in the history of psychology. But there he is all by himself. Well, this is my chance to talk to what may have been the most famous psychologist that I would ever have a chance to meet. So my daughter and I go over to meet him and he's a very lovely man, very kind. And so he asked her, you know, what, uh, what grade was she in? What was she doing? And it turned out she had just gotten an assignment to memorize a speech. And so he said to her, have your, this will give you an idea how long ago this was. He said, have your daddy um, take this, this speech and have him um, Xerox it off or mimeograph it off 25 times. Who talks that way anymore, right? So I did just that and ran it off 25 times. And then he said, and then have him take a highlighter and uh, not a highlighter, um, a whiteout and white out three or four words in the first page, seven or eight words in the second page, maybe a dozen words on the third page. And so by the time you get to the last page, the 25th page, there's only a couple of words left on a page. He said, once he's done that, you read through those 25 pages just a few times and you'll have it down. Now, she was already planning on going home and talking to mirrors and, and just re reciting it over and over again. But the fact of the matter is, I can remember memorizing a, a speech as a kid and doing just that sort of thing myself. You know, we, we go home that night, and I had done just as uh, um, he'd, he would have us call him Fred. Um, as Fred had uh, um, said, and in no time, my daughter learned it, presented it right in front of him. So she goes to school the next day, does well in her speech. And so she was happy about um, that old guy, <laughs> um, Fred, he was, uh, that was really a good idea he came up with. <laughs> I said, yeah, he comes up with some really good ideas. Now she goes off to college a few years later, um, freshman year, and comes back Thanksgiving time and, and tells me, Dad, did you know that that Skinner guy was really famous? <laughs> And I said, sure, honey, I told you that. And she said, he's in all my books, my, my, my psych books and even in other books. And I said, honey, I told you at the time when you were happy about having memorized that speech, you weren't good. I said, can you remember what the speech was about? And she said, well, not really. And I said, I told you at the time, you probably wouldn't remember what the speech was about, but you would remember the guy who taught you how to do it was B.F. Skinner. And... Um, she said, oh yeah, there's a lesson to be learned from that. His trick, and he was good at tricks. He was really an engineer more than a scientist. He was a psychological engineer and his trick worked. She learned that speech in no time, but just as I predicted, you're not gonna remember the speech down the way, but you will remember the guy who taught you how to do it. But well, real education, it's what we are living with years after we've been taught that matters because that is what equips us to figure out the world we are encountering. Our ability to memorize or recognize something for the next few hours or the next few days 
really doesn't account for much in the long run. And it's interesting, even with Skinner himself, and he was a, a member of something that's very, uh, it's the creme de la creme at Harvard, it's the Society of Fellows. Uh, and at the faculty club, you get to sit at a very special table. Skinner, of course, was admitted into the Society of Fellows. Skinner knew about so much in the humanities. Well, he even started off thinking he wanted to be a, a get a degree in literature. He knew about humanities. He knew about history. He knew about literature. He knew about psychology. He knew about some things in, in the uh, physical sciences. And I got a hunch that the way he learned all of that was not behavioristically. Yeah, that, wow. Because he's also tagged as a social philosopher. Mm -hmm. Many of the books. Are... Oh, yeah. Um, so what is social psychology? Um, right after this, what is social psychology? And what do people like Jerome Bruner and Paul Bloom have to say about the teaching and learning environment? Okay, well, let's start off with a straightforward claim um, about uh, the role of culture in our lives. Um, all too often, people are in the habit now of saying, culture is all that matters. You know, you are who you are because of your culture, your family of origin and so on. But we know from uh, all sorts of work that's done in biology and genetics and um, evolutionary psychology and, and uh, uh, elsewhere that um, culture matters, but it is not all that matters. And so one of the things we have going on with social psychology, they're looking largely at the part where culture matters. So we're really happy that they do that. And then we want to also be attentive to what the neurophysiologists, neuroscientists, and cognitive scientists are doing too. We've got to balance it all out. But for the social psychologists, let's talk about some of the things that they do. One of the things that they're very effective at doing is identifying things that affect our thinking that we never even knew were affecting our thinking. Let me give you a little experiment that uh, is often done in social psychology classes. Think about, um, do this to others, uh, running, you gotta run the experiment to others. So get a group of people to listen to you and ask them uh, to divide them into two groups, have one go into your living room, one go into a bedroom or whatever, go into the one group and say, uh, can, can you guys remember the last three digits of your, um, Social security number, you don't have to ask them what it is. And, and of course, they're all going to say, oh, yeah, okay. I just wanted to see if you could. But, but here, here's, here's what I really want to know. Uh, how, many, how many restaurants do you think there are in um, your city? Um, I'm in Houston right now. So um, uh, there's an answer to that. I'll tell you what the answer is in a moment. But just ask the people how many restaurants do you think there are in Houston that ranges from a McDonald's to the fanciest restaurant in town, places where the health inspectors have to go. How many restaurants do you think are in town? And just think about that number for a moment. Write it down. You might have them write it down. Then go into the other group that might be in a living room or whatever. And you say, um, all right, uh, listen, uh, I got, oh, oh, before I ask you this, can you guys remember the last uh, five or six digits of your social security number? And of course they go, yeah. And I said, well, you don't have to tell me. I just wonder if you could remember it. You all can remember it, right? And of course they're going to say, yeah, they can remember it. Okay. Well, anyhow, here's what I really want to ask you. Um, Houston's big city. How many restaurants do you think there are in the city? Um, and what we're going to define as a restaurant is any place where the health, um, uh, uh, health inspectors have to go to, uh, to inspect. So ranging from a McDonald's to the fanciest restaurant in town. Okay, now write your, your guesses down. Now, bring everybody together from the two rooms. Tell them what you did and the questions that you gave to each. And you say, now, how many of you that um, had 
to remember just your last three digits of your social security number. I want you all to tell me what your guesses were about the number of restaurants in Houston. And when they go through, say there's three or four of them, their numbers are gonna be pretty low. There's actually 13,700 and some restaurants that get inspected at least at the time that you know, I did this, this thing with students. There were 13,700 and some restaurants. Your students, your, the people you are, are getting responses from will have grossly underestimated that. You can bet on it. And into the group where you asked them to have five or six, can you remember the last five or six numbers in your um, uh, social security number? Well, oh yeah, but you didn't associate that at all with the question you asked them. But their guesstimates are gonna be much, much larger when they guess at how many restaurants are inspected by health inspectors in Houston. Now the two aren't tied together by any kind of logic and yet the environment led to very distinct and observable differences between the two groups. There was a TV show uh, that showed some psychological experiments and they were taken largely from social psychology. One of the things they showed was um, the interviewer would ask people to give an estimate about some kind of um, numerical thing. And right behind the interviewer was a big billboard advertising something, but it had a huge number on it, like 12,116 or whatever, uh, you know, just glaring out there. Uh, and it was a regular sales thing. It wasn't even part of the experiment. The experimenter found this location, however, you know, decided to do that. And then they asked people on the street to give a guesstimate of how many of such and such, um, you know, whatever the answer was. These answers should have been down around two or 3,000. The answers were all astronomically higher, closer to that 12,000 that was behind the interviewer. The people claimed not to have seen that number on that billboard. And yet, how is it that everyone who was asked the question with the billboard behind them came up with astronomically higher numbers than other people were interviewed when the interviewer had turned his back. So now he's facing people on the street, coming down the street, can't see the front of the billboard. And he would ask them, you know, what was their best guess? And they would come up with a different number, a much lower number. Things that we don't even think are affecting us. It's amazing how many of those things, in fact, are affecting us. And um, social psychologists have really been creative in identifying some of those things. A long time ago, we've been hearing, because you know, there were social psychologists going back to the 30s and 40s, and, and, and we've heard about the influence of peer pressure on kids and so on and so forth. Of course it's there. But how subtle it is, how ubiquitous it is from every angle, it, it's breathtaking. And, and so one can easily appreciate why sometimes we overestimate the influence of culture because you know social psychology has shown us it has so much influence from so many different directions. I remember sitting with my youngest daughter one time watching, trying to be a good dad, uh, watching television shows like um, Disney and um, things on Nickelodeon and so on. Shows about little eight, nine, 10 year old kids. They're all dating. They've got, you know, dating is a part of everything that's going on. And I'm thinking, I don't remember that kind of stuff being important to me when I was a little kid or even with my other children when they were, because they were much uh, older. Um, and when they were growing up, that wasn't normal TV fare. And yet in my daughter's world, my youngest daughter's world, that was very common. I mean, her world and, you know, she's talking to girlfriends and all that, you know, whether or not Jimmy likes Harry and Henrietta, that, that's all part of the normal conversation that it, and it has been. Social psychology has done a great job of helping us understand how extensive culture is when it comes to mattering 
And then hopefully we've got to be smart enough to realize it doesn't tell the whole story. Culture matters, but it's not all that matters. That's profound. That's profound. Um, so on this subject of social learning, um, the next question for you, what is so important about Albert Bandura's notion of role modeling? Okay, um, well, Jerome Bruner, one of the things that he, he was a social psychologist, and one of the ideas that he came up with, which was so uh, illuminating, was that we're naturally, and it almost sounds like he's really doing cognitive science or evolutionary psychology rather than social psychology. But he was trained as a social psychologist. He claimed to be a social psychologist. So. But he said, humans have a natural tendency to tell themselves narratives. We all seem to be intuitively aware that somehow our life story must make sense. No matter how odd the predicaments we seem to get ourselves into in time, we figure out a way to tell a story that somehow makes it all sense, make it all make sense. If we had some tragedy, we might do, we might take a Freudian turn or two and say, ah, it came about because, you know, my, my mother was so brutal or it came about because, you know, my father was um, an alcoholic or whatever. We're always looking for ways to explain our world because it's somehow we think it has to, the story has to make sense. We just can't accept the idea that there's a blip between this point in my life and this point in my life, and there's no causative relations that I can identify and point to. Fact of the matter is, it may be because of biochemical changes that happen to us for some odd reason that suddenly we behave differently and the world behaved differently to us as a result. And we didn't know that it happened, we just know. Boy, the world and I are very different. We're at odds with one another for some strange reason right now. And Bruno would say, yeah, that's very troubling to us because we got to make a story that we think makes sense. In reality, sometimes the stories don't always make sense, no matter how hard we try. Paul Bloom, who, um, uh, Many educators think of, when they hear Bloom, they think of a guy named Ben Bloom at the University of Chicago, who talked a lot about um, thinking processes. But Paul Bloom is at Yale. He's a middle-aged fellow now, very competent. Um, uh, Paul Bloom talked about early moral development. We had been in the habit of thinking that you know kids start off being kind of selfish, and then they get in high school and they become more likely to share with others and more socially sensitive and so on. Well, Paul, Paul Bloom pointed out some really interesting things we never anticipated. Uh, for example, infants hours after birth, so there's been no cultural influence. Infants hours after birth when they're in the nursery with other infants. If an infant cries out in pain, all the infants seem to respond and they cry out as well. In contrast, if an infant cries out for some kind of inconsequential thing, like he wants to get fed or uh, has soiled himself, um, a few other infants may cry, others may stay sleeping, but if the infant cries out in pain, they all seem to be alert to that. Paul Bloom ran experiments with kids that were like one and a half, two years old, where they're playing on the floor, and, and he as the experimenter would walk in and accidentally drop something near a kid. And they could pick up the object and try to hand it back to them. He would show them little cartoons of geometric figures, squares, triangles, circles, or whatever. And he might take uh, a triangle and have the triangle look as though he's mean poking the circle, or poking the square, and, and then the square runs away, or the squirrel or the circle jumps way up, or whatever. And then afterwards, you ask the kids. All right, here's a squirrel or a square, here's a circle, here's a triangle, uh, here's some kind of an octagon type of thing. Uh, which do you want to play with? Nobody wanted to play with triangles after seeing the little cartoon. And then if later on he asked about why, why didn't you all pick 
the triangle. I want you pick squares and circles. And, and the kids say, I don't like triangles. How did that happen? And um, apparently it happened from something that they weren't really conscious of processing, but these little cartoons had the effect. Now, what about high school kids? Are high school kids really becoming more moral and that we're selfish when we're young? Well, Bloom has already shown, no, we're not selfish when we're young. We'll pick up those old books when we're a year and a half or try to hand it to the researcher. Mommy, can I help you? Three, four years old. Kids in high school might be very concerned about climate change, recycling, big ideas like that that can get all the kids together to say, yeah, we got to do this. Some of those same kids, it never dawns on them to walk across the street and cut the grass of those neighbors across the street whose father has been in a hospital for two weeks with a massive stroke. Those same kids, it may be that it never dawns on the high school kid to say, mom, we've got so much casserole left over from dinner tonight. Can we go down to the Anderson's house? Uh, their, their mother is in the, the cancer hospital being treated for some type of cancer. Can we take our extra casserole down to them? Why haven't they thought of that? And I'm, we're not saying that none of them ever have, of course, but what we're talking about statistical generalities that can be demonstrated. And, and so getting kids to be riled up about climate change, that's good stuff. We don't want to complain about that. But they should also be concerned about what can I do to help the neighbor across the street? What can I do to help the neighbor a couple of houses down who's in, who's in real trouble? Grand social schemes are important, but they're no more important than reaching out a hand to the person next to us who needs a helping hand. Wow. Wow. So Dr. Wagner, we will continue this conversation um, and second part of our video for the unconventional sketch of history of education psychology. Thank you so much for your time and, and the insights and the knowledge that you share with us. Thank you. Thank you to Paul. I look forward to continuing this with you again.